Steve is a good friend. He's a good man. I got to spend a uh, tour with him at the footsteps of St. Paul. His wife's really the better half, but she's not here. But what are we going to do? We'll have to put up with Steve. But Steve is a convert from the Baptist faith. He was a fundamentalist, uh, and he come, come over to the faith, and he is just on fire with the love of God. And he's on fire with so much knowledge. And if you ever do a tour with him and encourage you to do one, they have one coming up with Legatus to the Holy Land, that you'll find out how much knowledge he has and how much the love of Jesus and the love of the church. So they entered the church, him and his wife, on Pentecost Sunday in 1994 at Christ the King Parish in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Steve wrote a letter to his father explaining why he became Catholic, which later became the book called Crossing the Tiber. If you haven't read it, it's a good book. Even Evangelical Protestants discover the historical church published by Ignatius Press. Since then, Steve's passion for the truth found within the Catholic tradition has had led many from his business in pursuit of writing, speaking, producing Catholic films, and leading pilgrimages to the biblical lands. Steve and Janet have been to the Holy Land over a hundred times. I think they know what they're doing and leading thousands of pilgrims. Steve is a regular guest on Catholic radio and TV, including Catholic Answers, Ave Maria Radio, Relevant Radio, and of course, EWTN. I'd like to introduce to all of you, give a great round of applause for Mr. Steve Ray. Good morning. I figured if Ben Shapiro could wear his hat, I could wear my hat. <laughs> Plus, uh, a lot of people don't know who I am if I don't have my hat on, so I've got mine on. Happy Feast of St. Paul's Conversion today. And uh, I relate to that conversion because I used to be an anti-Catholic out attacking the Catholic Church, and now look where I am. So thank you, St. Paul. Pray for us. Um, my wife and I love to lead pilgrimages and talk about the Bible and teach now that I'm a Catholic. I love the Bible a hundred times more now than I used to when I taught it as a Protestant. And uh, we have just a quick little video, just one minute to show you about our pilgrimages, and then we're going to jump right in and talk to you about the fifth gospel, the beauty and the truth of the fifth gospel. What started all of this for us is I went to the Holy Land for the first time in 1995, never dreamed I'd ever go there, never had an interest in going there before I became a Catholic, and I was totally overwhelmed. I cried my way through the whole land, and it had the same impact on my kids, and they'll tell you today, my four kids and 16 grandkids. I've taken them now, the grandkids, and they'll tell you that it changed their lives so much. That's why they're authentic Catholics today, one of the reasons. I was on a plane one time from New York to Israel, one of my earlier trips, and I sat next to a rabbi. Actually, it was a kind of an empty plane, and I saw him, and I went and sat next to him, a Jewish rabbi with a black hat and very distinctive. And I started, he was very leery of me at first. He didn't like, he was very cautious. But once he found out I knew the Bible and I loved the, his Tanakh, it's called our Old Testament, he opened up and we spent the whole trip talking about the Psalms and how he interprets them and what it means to him. And then as we we're flying along over the Mediterranean, I saw the coastline of Israel and I said, Rabbi, Rabbi, we're here. There's the coastline of Israel. And instantly he burst into tears and started to cry. 
And I said, Rabbi, and he's praying in Hebrew and he's just crying. And I said, Rabbi, is this your first time to Israel? He says, no, 28 times. <laughs> and I know that feeling. The first time I went in 1995, I remember it was not the new airport they have today. It was the old airport. You had to go down the lad steps off the plane across the tarmac to the old airport. And I remember when I got my backpack on my back, I stepped onto that land. I was overcome with emotion. I remember it even now. I get that feeling. I fell flat on my face on the tarmac and I wept. I was in the land where God had walked. And my poor wife, she's so patient with me. She just stood there. Okay, Steve, it's time to go now. And we walked into the airport. The history of this land of Israel and the surrounding area is a story of our salvation history. It's hard to understand it when you're in America speaking English in a democracy 2,000, 4,000 years even later. But to go there and walk and to see the truth and the beauty of the fifth gospel, and we'll get to why it's called that in a minute. But it all started really 4,000 years ago with a man called Abram. God had tried to, create, uh, tried to get men to follow him, the Garden of Eden. They fell into sin and disobeyed. And then he had the ark and Noah and he started over and again. Everybody fell into sin. And it just became a big mess. And then he found a man who was in Ur of the Chaldees. That's in Iraq. If you want to see it, I've got all our video movies that we've made at the store here. And we went two years ago and filmed the whole first part of Abraham's life in Iraq. And 2000, uh, 4,000 years ago, God started, looked for one man he could start all over with to build it all over. And he found Abraham. He was 75 years old. And he said, Abraham, I want you to go to a land that I will show you. I'll give you a son. I'll give you the land. I want you to pack up and go. Take all 318 of your men who work for you. And I want you to go six, and I'm not going to tell you, it's 1,600 miles, but God didn't tell him where it was. Now, if that had been me, I, or probably you as well, you would have said, okay, God, I'm very interested in this proposition. How far is it? Well, I have a deed to the land. I want that signed. I want a contract with you. I want to know about my pension, my health insurance, and I want to know when I'll have this son and have all of these contractual conditions that you gave God before you leave. But that's why God chose Abram and not me, because Abram believed God, and he packed up with all of his men, and he went 1,600 miles up the Fertile Crescent and down into what was called Cana, Canaan at the time. And one of my favorite poems that I use in, my mo in the movie that I made is from a Father Killian, and it gives me goosebumps every time I read this poem, but I'm only going to read the last few lines. When Abraham heard what God said, 75 years old, his wife is 65 years old, he said, Am I supposed to scuttle my life upon the road to some mumbled nowhere? In ten generations since the flood, you have spoken to no one. Now, like thunder on a clear day, you give commands. Pull up my tent, desert my home, the graves of my ancestors. You come very late, Lord, you come very late. But my camels will leave in the morning. This is the start of the Holy Land. This is the start of God's real plan of salvation where he found a man who would trust him no matter what. He trusted him again later because when he was 99 years old, God again came and said, I'm going to reaffirm my covenant. You've been wandering in this wilderness here for 25 years with your flocks. I'm going to give you a covenant now and a sign of the covenant. And Abraham says, what will that sign be? Finally, I'm going to get something good out of this deal. I've been wandering around. Nothing I've gotten yet from you. Not one inch of the land I own. I have no son. And God says, I'm going to give you a sign of the covenant. Here's a flint knife. I want you to circumcise yourself and all 318 of your men. And I think if it was me, I would have said, thank you very much, God, but I'm going back to Iraq. <laughs> but it said that the flint knives flashed in the morning and all of his men were circumcised. This is Abram. This is how the Holy Land got started. The land of the kings and the prophets, the saints and scholars, all of these wonderful people that we know so much about. God walked there. That's why it's called the Holy Land. But why did God give that land? Why not some other land? There's a joke I love to tell. George Bush was walking through the airport when he was president, and he sees this old man with a white beard and a robe and a staff, and he goes up to the man. He says, are you Moses? And the man quickly ran away. 
And George Bush went over and he said, don't you know who I am? I'm the president. George Bush, I'm talking to you. And the guy ran away. He said to the Secret Service agent, you go over and find out if that's Moses. So the Secret Service agent goes over. He says, Look, listen, I, I got to do this. Help me out here a little bit. The President Bush wants me. He said, are you Moses? He said, yes, I'm Moses. He says, well, why wouldn't you tell him? He says, because the last time I talked to a Bush, I got sent out into the wilderness for 40 years. <laughs> and then I was given the only land in the Middle East with no oil. But why did God give him that land? Why that land and not some other? Because it is a bridge. Israel is a bridge along the Mediterranean. If you were in all of the big civilizations up where Europe is today, or Egypt down below, or in all of Persia or Babylon, they all had to travel down that road. It's called the Via Maris, the way by the sea. And whoever owns that piece of land, that land bridge, owns the taxes of all the merchants there, control all of the travel between. That's why God gave that. He wanted them to be evangelists. As all these nations travel through that land, tell them about God. Tell them about the true and living God. They failed to do that. But God gave them that piece of land because it was the most unique, special piece of land anywhere in the Middle East. And why is it called Holy Land? Exodus chapter 3. Moses was walking through the wilderness and as he came towards an area that he'd walked on for 40 years, he's been in this wilderness for 40 years with sheep and goats. And the same area he is now, there's a bush on fire. And he goes over to the bush and the voice of God comes from the bush and says, take off your sandals because this is holy ground. But Moses could have said, but this is the same dirt and rocks I walked on last week. What makes it different now? It looks the same. But what makes a difference is the presence of God. When God touches something, he sanctifies it. For me as a Catholic, to visit these lands is much different than it would have been as a Protestant. As a Protestant, we are propositional. It's all about emotion, tours, seeing things, talking. But as a Catholic, I have that. But it's also, I have now a sense of sacramentality, incarnational theology. God became a man, and when he touches the land, he sanctifies it, he makes it different. Rome is wonderful, it's sacred places. But only in Israel is it holy ground, because that's where God walked. It's, a, it's not the same dirt. It's different now, because God walked there. The land also speaks for itself, in, even in the geography of the land. I want to read just a poem that I have that we read to our pilgrims when we take them out on the boat on the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful thing to see that land. And even the land itself speaks and gives you parables, even when you look at the geography. Here's a poem that we read when we're out on the boat on the Sea of Galilee. It says, there are two seas in Israel. And it goes like this. There are two seas in Israel. One is fresh and fish are in it. Splashes of green adorn its banks. Trees spread their thirsty roots over it and stretch out their thirsty roots to sip of its healing waters. The river Jordan makes the sea with sparkling water from the hills. So it laughs in the sunshine. And men build their houses near to it and birds their nests. And every kind of life is happier because the Sea of Galilee is there. The river Jordan flows on to another sea. And here there is no splash of fish, no fluttering leaf, no songs of birds, no children's laughter. Travelers choose another route and less on urgent business. The air hangs heavy above the waters, and neither man nor beast nor fowl will drink. What makes this mighty difference between these neighbor seas? Not the River Jordan. It empties the same good water into both of the seas. It's not the soil in which they lie, nor the country round about. This is the difference. The Sea of Galilee receives but does not keep the water from the Jordan. For every drop that flows in, another drop flows out. The giving and receiving are go on in equal measure. The other sea is shrewder. It hoards its income jealously. It will not be tempted into any, any generous impulse. Every drop it gets, it keeps. The Sea of Galilee gives and it lives. The other sea gives nothing. It's called the dead. There are two kinds, there are two seas in Palestine, and there are two kinds of people in this world. What kind are we? Even the land itself has its own parables when you see the land. What's so unique about this land? It is a very interesting land. Only 8,000 square miles. 
Do you know that would fit inside Lake Michigan two and a half times? Israel would fit inside of California 20 times. It's just a small little sliver of land with eight, little more than 8 million people. Six and a half million are Jews, 1.7 million Arabs. And how many Christians? It used to be 100% Christians. Now, less than 1.5%. Which is one of the reasons I like taking groups because I go there to support the local Christians. I don't just go there to see the stones from the past, but to see the living stones of today and to support them there. And my first trip there, I couldn't just give up with just seeing the land. I went there one time with my family, and I saw it. I cried my way through the whole thing. I remember one time I was asked to read at Mass. I just finished writing my book. It's at the store back there called Upon This Rock, about the life and the history of St. Peter and the primacy of Rome. They asked me to read that. I stood up in that church of, called the primacy of Peter, and I said a reading from the second letter of Peter, and I choked up, and I couldn't read it. I struggled for over a minute to read that passage. I couldn't do it. I looked at the priest and I said, sorry, and I had to sit down. The first time I went, I was so emotional. I couldn't believe that I was in the land that I had read about and studied and seen in, in movies. I wanted to immerse myself. So I started going back. He said, I, uh, Father said, I've been there a hundred times. Actually, we've been over there 100, over 160 times. And for making movies and leading pilgrimages, I've led, we've led with the same guide over 60 times. And, but I wanted to immerse myself. And the second or third time I went there, I remember that we, we, uh, were, I went out running because I love to run. I've run around the Sea of Galilee. I've run between Nazareth and Cana. Everywhere in Israel you can run, I've run. And I wanted to go out along the sea and run. And I did, and I was looking for the fishermen. I wanted just to find out if the New Testament, the Gospels are true about all the things it says about the Sea of God. These are really storms. Why do you fish at night? And these kind of things. So I went to a little cove where the little fishing boats are coming in. And I, so I yelled out, there's maybe 10 or 15, do any of you speak English? And one poor guy, he probably regrets saying it that now. But he says, I speak English. Very thick Hebrew accent. His name was Shimi Cohen and his buddy Udi. And I went up and I started, can I ask you a few questions? And he's there pulling all the fish out. You know, they just throw them in the bottom of the boat and then they sort them in the morning. Read, you read that in the gospel. They sort them out, the good ones, the bad ones, the big ones, the small ones. And they sit and the refrigerated trucks are already there to buy them right off, the, well, right off the boat. And this guy, he's bringing these big fish out, putting them in crates. And I'm asking him all these questions. He's all sweaty and smells like fish. And I said to him, why do you fish at night? How much money are you going to make for all of these? What kind of fish are they? Does it really? He says, stop, you ask too many questions. <laughs> he said, if you want to know all of these things, he said, be here at 6 o'clock tonight and go out fishing with us tonight. Whew. Anybody who knows me knows what I did. <laughs> I went back home to the hotel, took a nap, and I was there at 6 in the morning, and I went out fishing with those guys all night on the Sea of Galilee. We went up to the northern tip at the mouth of the Jordan River. We set the nets there a half mile long, but like a wall of nets all around a half mile with red kerosene lanterns and an opening in the, in, the, uh, in the circle. Then they went up to the mouth of the Jordan River and they tied their boats to the, uh, to the bushes. And there's about 10 other boats with fishermen in it. And we're, they're just eating their dinner. They have to wait for the sun to set. I found out why later, because the, smish, the fish are smart and they can see the net. They're called the Amnon. The pilgrims call them St. Peter's fish, but they're Amnon. They're like tilapia. And they're smart and they can see the net in the daylight. But when it's dark, they can't see the net and they swim into it. And so we were talking and I was asking a thousand questions and they're yelling back and forth to the other boats. And I'm saying, what did he say? What did you say? What, what did he say? And they're eating and they're take, taking the little, picking twigs off, the, and cleaning their teeth. And I had to ask him, I says, you know, I'm, if I have, I'm out here all night. What happens if you have to, you know, use the facilities? He goes, here, who's this? Zippy, I show you. And he decided the boat. <laughs> right at that time, the other guy grabs a pot of coffee, fills it, and I said, I'll wait for the next pot. I'm not drinking that one. <laughs> but I tell that story because it's so earthy. These guys were real Jewish fishermen. And all of a sudden, I had this kind of an incarnational moment. I'm out here on the Sea of Galilee with Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And I asked them questions all night. And when we go out on the boat with our pilgrims, I tell the whole story of that night and all the things I learned. Oh, by the way, when we came into the opening in that net, they gave me a toilet plunger 
and a hammer, and they said, here, you have to go kerplush, kerplush, and then every once in a while I'll take the hammer and go bang, bang on the side. So I'm an obedient guy. I, I play the, you know, by the rules. So I'm going kerplush, kerplush, bang, bang, kerplush. And then I look at him, I say, wait a minute, you guys are having fun with me, aren't you? <laughs> And they said no, and they explained what it was, is it's night now. That big net is a half a mile big circle, and when we go in, I make those noises, it scares the fish, and they swim in every direction, and when they do, they hit the nets. So all night long, I asked the questions about these things. Another thing, time, I was out running along the Sea of Galilee, and you know, when we are here in the United States, we're always defending the divinity of Christ. Nobody really is going to argue that he was a real human being, a real human on the earth. But what we are, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons come to the door, and we are convincing and trying to convince our secular culture that Jesus Christ didn't just exist, but he was God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we want to convince people of this. But in the Holy Land, we already assume that as Catholics, and I want to help you understand the humanity of Christ what it was for him to be a human being. And this is a little earthy, but if you don't like earthy things, cover your ears for a moment. But I was out running along, and this is one of those incarnational moments where I really felt like I got to know Jesus and the apostles. These 13 guys out walking along the shore of Galilee. And I'm out running, and I, every runner knows that it, you should take some toilet paper along in the morning. You just never know when nature's gonna call. And sure enough, I'm two miles out, and there's no getting back to the hotel, and I forgot to bring the toilet paper, so I found a nice bush and I went in the bush and took care of business and you know it says no jobs done till the paperwork's complete well there wasn't any so I found some big leaves and hope they weren't some kind of Israeli poison ivy and I stepped out of that bush and I said oh my goodness that's what Jesus did every morning Every morning, those 13 guys are walking along the shore of Galilee, and one by one, they'd step aside. That's the biblical euphemism for use the toilet. One by one, Jesus would step aside into a bush and said, I'll catch up with you in a minute. And they'd come out, and they'd run to catch up with the group. And I realized Jesus left the glories of heaven he left all of the angels surrounding him with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the glories of heaven. He's in need of nothing, streets lined with, paved with gold, and he's all of this beautiful situation for all of eternity, and he decides to come down and become one of us and sweat and eat and be hungry and be tired and squat in a bush every morning. You know, when the angels heard that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, was going to do this, I'm convinced the angels said... He's going to do what? It's called the scandal of the incarnation, of God taking on human flesh. The angel said, but he does, why does he go there? They don't even love him. They don't even obey him. They're constantly rebelling against him. Stiff-necked, stubborn people, us too. Why would he go down and become one of them? The scandal of the incarnation. And then it gets worse because then there's thing called a scandal of the cross. Because then when he's here, now the angel's here, he's going to die for them. The most excruciating pain devised by humankind, the Persians in 600 B.C., invented crucifixion, still the most excruciating form of death. And he's going to go be nailed to a cross. The one who created the earth is going to be buried in the earth. And the angel said, he's going to do what? And when you walk through the land, you think about Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, coming down and living. Not like we live here in this hotel where we have everything that we need and want and like handed to us on a platter. He came to a place where there was none of that. It was a tough, rustic life. The only way I can possibly get my grandkids to understand what Jesus did there for us is to take them out for a walk. I have 16 of them now. And to take them out a walk in a field and get down on our belly in the grass and find an anthill. And I say to my grandkids, do you think you could ever... Do, where, where do those ants live? What, they live in the ground, Grandpa. They're running through the grass and the dirt and they go down in the holes. I said, do you think you could ever love the ants enough to become one of them? No, Grandpa. We could never do anything like that. Do you think if you did do that, that you would be willing to die for the ants? If they were in trouble, would you be willing to die for them? No, Grandpa, we could never do anything like that. 
And yet when you walk through the land, I love to think about what Jesus gave up in heaven to come down and walk among us to bring our salvation in the land. And he made it holy by his footsteps there. The Jordan River, you get the water from the Jordan River. You don't have to take it over to the priest and have him bless that water. That water's already perpetually blessed because Jesus put his feet in the Jordan River. There, the water did not sanctify Jesus. Jesus sanctified water so that water can now sanctify you. And these are the things you see and you realize. For example, Mary, she was, we, we think of her as kind of floating three feet off the ground. You see her walking to, uh, going to visit Elizabeth, for example. Now, by the way, she lived in a cave. She didn't live in a house like you and I do. She lived in a cave with no running water, no toilets, no anything. We like to think of Mary when we see pictures of her and artwork and statues. She was so perfect. She just back out from the beauty parlor. She just had her toenails done. And I know why art presents Mary that way, because she's the immaculate conception, the queen of heaven, the sinless one. And so art not only portrays what you see on the outward, but it also is there to show the inner qualities. But I have a talk I give called Mary, the real girl, and the woman of mystery, two sides to one coin. On the one side, yes, she is the Immaculate Conception and all that beautiful inner qualities. But if you had ever met her in the streets of Nazareth, I doubt you would have recognized her. Walking barefoot 15 minutes every morning to the well to get water to bring it back to their cave. And I like asking people, what do you think the Holy Family did the first thing they got up in the morning? Pray? Is that the first thing you do in the morning when you get up? People get up and use the restroom before they pray. That's what Mary and Jesus and Joseph did too. But when you live in a cave with no running water, where do you do this? See, one of the things I want people to realize when we walk through the land is what Mary was really like. When she went to visit her relative Elizabeth, she didn't jump in Uber or a taxi and go to cross town to visit. That was 100 miles she walked. That was five days of morning from sunup till sundown walking. And when we're driving on our bus between Nazareth and Jerusalem, I keep saying, oh, and by the way, Mary is still walking. Because it doesn't give you any less of an appreciation for Mary to know how she really lived and what she really suffered. It gives me more of an appreciation, more of a love for her. She was a tough little Jewish girl if she was anything. Can you imagine walking all that way back and forth and then go back again, nine months pregnant. She now walks. Or you say she was riding a donkey. That's worse. <laughs> I've done that in the deserts before, ride a donkey. I'd rather walk. That bony back beast was my enemy all the whole day. <laughs> but imagine walking 100 miles when Israel it can be in the summertime 100, 120 degrees. But Israel is a country where almost everywhere you are, it's a biblical site. Something happened there. Something reminds us. The rosary mysteries, you pray the rosary. Guess what? You pray the rosaries in Rome, that's fine. But if you pray the rosaries in Israel, you pray them, we pray every mystery where it happened. Every single mystery where it happened. There's only one we can't do that. You know which one it is? The coronation. Can't get to heaven yet, but the other, the other 19, we pray along the way so that you remember in your mind where that was. And we give rosaries out, and you touch them on all the holy places. And when they come back, they're third-class relics because they touch the tomb of Christ and the top of Calvary where the, flood, the blood flowed. You know, when we touch the top of Calvary, we go there at 5 in the morning when no one's there. And when you touch that, I say to people, if you had touched that 2,000 years ago, your hands would have come up sticky with his blood. That's what you're touching right there. In 1964, Pope Paul VI came to visit the Holy Land. Why was that so unique? Because he was the first successor of Peter to visit Israel since Peter. 2,000 years, no pope had come to the land of Israel. And in 1964, Pope Paul VI came, and when he walked through the land, he said, this is the fifth gospel, gospel number five. Why? Because when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read those gospels, you're reading black and white. 
But when you walk through the land and you see it and you get an uh, idea of the proximity between places and that, for example, the Dead Sea is the lowest place on the face of the earth. Did you know that? If Mount Everest is the highest place on the face of the earth, the Dead Sea in the Jordan Valley is the lowest, 1,250 feet below sea level. The other end is Mount Hermon, almost 10,000 feet above sea level. Such a unique land. And when you walk the land and you read the Gospels as you move to the different places and renew your wedding vows in Cana and pray the mystery, the first mystery of the Rosie of the Annunciation at the cave where the angel actually stood and talked to Mary, everything comes alive. And he said, this is the fifth Gospel. Because when you see that, the other four pop into widescreen technicolor. The number one comment I get from people who are on a pilgrimage is that the Bible came alive for me. I can't go to Mass anymore and sit there and hear the gospel because I want to hit the person next to me. I was there. I was there. I sit at Mass even myself, and I hear the gospels. I said, Janet, isn't it amazing we were there? Even just last week or last month, so many times. But the fifth gospel makes it all come alive. You're introduced to the Holy Family, to the Apostles to the prophets and the kings and the whole story. One of my favorite things to do there is there's something called a promenade. It's up above the, on the south side of Jerusalem. It's way up high. And up on that promenade, it's an overview, and you can see all of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives and Mount Zion. And I take 25 minutes to tell the whole story of salvation from Adam and Eve until today because you can see it all right there in front of your eyes. The only way you could get a better view of Jerusalem is from a helicopter, which I've done too. But that is the whole story, it took place right there. And it's, people are amazed at how small, how short a distances there are between things. A pilgrimage is something that's not a vacation or a tour. Protestants call it a tour. Protestants don't call it a pilgrimage. They won't use that word. Martin Luther wrote against pilgrimages. And a Protestant goes there with Bible in hand, and it's a tour. Catholics go there on a pilgrimage. You know, the pilgrims came from England to the United States. They came as strangers, foreigners to a foreign land. And that's what a pilgrim is. That's what it means. Someone who gets away from their everyday life, and they go in search of God and of holiness and to seek after a closer relationship with God. It's a place where you put your gadgets away. You put your, get out of your comfort zone, get out of the normal life that you live and you go like Elijah to the mountain. And God is not in the fire and God is not in the storm and God is not in the earthquakes. But there you listen for the still small voice of God. In my movie that I made on Elijah, we found his cave up on Mount Sinai where he was. And it says that word, a still small voice, and actually in Hebrew is a silence. Elijah went up and he listened to the silence. And that was the voice of God. And that's what the Holy Land can do if you go there to listen. Not just to talk and not just to go see things and eat all the food. Oh, we eat nice food. But a pilgrimage is a place and a time where you set everything aside and you go in search of God in a deeper relationship with him. And yes, Catholics should have a relationship with Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit. We think that's Protestant terminology. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, no, no, no. That was Catholic long before Protestants came along. And this is something that helps that. I'll tell you one more story. My daughter, Emily, when she was 15 years old, she's 28 now and married and has a baby. But when we took her there, many times she's gone with us, but when she was 15, she said, Dad, I'm going to go over to the tomb to pray. Where we stay in the hotel is only 10 minutes walk to the Holy Sepulcher. And so I said, okay. She had a friend with her, and they walked over through the old city to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and they went into the tomb to pray. An hour and a half later, she came back to the hotel in tears, sobbing hysterically, threw herself on the bed and cried. And I said, Emily, what happened? And she wouldn't answer me. I said, Emily, what happened? And she threw her tears, said, Dad, the only thing that happened is you've taken me there so many times before, but today, when I was there, I realized Jesus was really there. I realized he was there. He spoke to me, Dad. He was there 2,000 years ago, and I just realized that that was the place where he was dead and where he rose from the dead, but he was there today, and I felt him, Dad. 
I talked to my daughter today and she'll tell you that's one of the reasons why she loves Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church so much today is because of that experience she had in the tomb. The Holy Land is a marvelous place. It's so true that I tell our pilgrims my goal of taking you is so that you see how true it is. So that you're so convinced of the authenticity of the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ and the church that when you come home, you're going to love it and you're going to live it and you're going to proclaim it and even be willing to die for it if you have to because it's worth it. So, thanks for listening. We have a pilgrimage with Legatus going in September. Some people came up and said, we're thinking of joining that trip. Well, it's too late. It's been sold out for three months. It sold out three weeks after we announced it. And we have another one because of that. They said, can we do another one? I said, sure, I'll take another group in March of 2020, and that bus is already half full. So corporate travel, John Hale here, we, they have a table back there. And if you're interested in going with Legatus in March of 2020, we still have some seats open. And... Thanks for listening, and I'm going to be doing Catholic Answers Live on the radio show here. I love doing that today in the front of the audience with Trent Horn. And I just love being Catholic on the feast day of St. Paul. I just get tears in my eyes thinking I really found it, the best kept secret in the world. I used to teach classes on how to convert Catholics out of the Catholic Church. <laughs> and now I'm doing penance, but it's not penance, it's a joy to tell Catholics what a wonderful thing it is they have. And many are cradle Catholics and they really haven't gotten a chance to really understand the beauty of it. But it is the truth and it's worth living for and it's worth dying for. And the early martyrs taught us that. And I'm so grateful to St. Paul when I stood there on the dusty road where St. Paul had his conversion. I wept there looking down over the city of Damascus, nine miles around the bend down in the valley. If it hadn't been for St. Paul, you and I probably wouldn't be here today because it was St. Paul that took the gospel out and brought it to the Gentiles. He brought it to us. And for that, I say thank you, St. Paul. Pray for us. God bless you. Steve.